know who Superman is? <laughs> Watch this. Oh! Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian Jack with Superman's Comics, and we're here again each and every week to talk about the hottest books that were released. That's right. This is that Bolo show, the Be On The Lookout show. In case you didn't notice on Instagram, we had the Bolo list back. Yes, we're trying to get that back each and every week. Here's the show where we're going to talk about those first appearances, those reader buzz books, the variant buzz books, and of course, Jack's long-term play. Jack, how's your new comic book day? It's a big, it's a big new comic book day. Um, you know, I think oftentimes when we do this little intro, we talk about our excitement for new comic book day. And look, we're always excited for new comic book day, even on the weakest of new comic book days. But this one is one of those ones that you kind of like mark on a calendar. There's only a few of these a year um, because there are some big releases and specifically one big release that, that we've been waiting for for most of 2020. Right. Seen a lot of people's hauls on Instagram. No doubt a lot of books on there. But either way, we're going to get into it right now, starting with those first appearances. First one, we're going to talk about first appearances that Dark Knight's death metal one shot, that Rise of New God that gave us what, the Chronicler? Yes. So uh, you and I were just talking about uh, which books we read so far today. And I actually forgot to throw this one in there. Um, what is going on with DC Comics, with Marvel? What are these guys doing? Because it, you're not going to think that that's not Cosmic Ghost Rider in this book. So it, it's one of those things where um, uh, it, it could be just James Tynan uh, kind of some fun and knowing that this is going to get people riled up and talking. Um, but certainly after having kind of like the little Easter egg seemingly in Thor 2, um, and having this in a DC book and then, uh, you know, with the Image Comics, Donny Cates crossover book kind of causing a stir, there's certainly, certainly, certainly enough people talking about the possibility of a Marvel DC crossover that I think that this character uh, and this book is a book that could have potential long term. Yeah, and, and you guys watching this, let us know, is this something that you picked up? What did you think? Did you think it was a Deathstroke Deadpool type thing or mm -hmm. just good clean fun who knows either way I've picked it up haven't had a chance to read it yet but the next one we'll talk about first appearances is that detective comics 1029 yeah so we're talking about a new villain for Batman with the mirror so this is this is a book I would say is a good long-term play this is uh one this is a book I usually like to highlight as my long-term play um I usually tend to stay away from some of the more obvious picks and I try to highlight books that are still cut price at the time we're recording this and this is one that fits into that because certainly Batman villains and anything added into the Batman family certainly has the potential to really grab the market uh, we've obviously seen what Punchline has done but where I would be a little more cautious is that this is coming to Detective Comics line which it tends to not necessarily have the same strength as the, the regular Batman title. And just because somebody appears in Detective Comics doesn't mean we'll see them in Batman, which is where we really need to see a character for a character to take off. But for cover price, uh, you know, using Brian's kind of like lottery ticket motto, I think this is a good pickup. Right. And sticking with DC and that Bat family, we get over to Batgirl number 50 with that first appearance of Ryan Wilder. Yes, lots of buzz on this one. This was this is one of the community favorites. Um, if you're not familiar with Ryan Wilder, Ryan Wilder is the new Bat uh, woman in the upcoming CW television show. Um, obviously, with Ruby Rose leaving, they they couldn't really kind of like just replace her and have it be Kate Kane and try to fool us. Uh, they went with an original character, which turned me off to the CW show altogether. Uh, I think it's cool and smart that they brought her into the comics. It still kind of feels after the fact, but either way, if, if the show can kind of gain some traction, this could be a good first appearance. Um, but I know everybody's getting excited about this one. I got to be grumpy old man on this one, Brian, because we talked about this with, you know, Bat, with Batwoman Beyond, where I say like, you know, Kate Kane couldn't take off and they get, they had everything behind that character um, from, her getting to like be the main character in detective comics for a run with amazing cover art um with her getting her own uh series in the new 52 her getting her own series in rebirth 
uh, her getting her own television show featured in the crossover and none of that could really spike the first appearance of beyond like 20 bucks. So I, it's hard for me to get too riled up about uh, any other version of Batwoman um, if, if that character couldn't really take off. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but thus far hasn't really been proven to be so. Yeah, that was during the run of what was it? The, was it J.G. Jones that was doing those covers? They had a little bit. They had J.G. Jones did. Yeah, they had J.G. Jones did an incentive. Alex Ross did an incentive. Adam Hughes did an incentive. Um, so that's like a great, great yeah. run of variant covers. But the last one we're talking about on first appearances this week is Spawn number 311, although it got news for other cover art, right? Yeah, last second switch of cover A and cover C causing allocation issues. The switch makes sense. Like the, the Barbieri cover for cover A makes more sense than the Matina cover, which looks more, just has that variant cover feel. Um, but doing it at the last second when people put their orders in specifically trying to get certain books, uh, it, it's difficult because certainly that Barbieri cover was less, say, attractive than the Matina cover. So people would have gone heavier or trying to get that Matina cover. But to be honest with you, I, I don't even really get too hype about that because the, the real reason that this book, by the way, this book sold 850,000 copies. Tell me the comic book market is not strong right now. Um, and it sold 150,000 copies largely because of that Chadwick Boseman homage. Amazing cover from Todd McFarlane. Uh, you get the, the Black Panther homage, but really, really, mo really, it's a tie to Chadwick Boseman. Uh, and then you get the one in five black and white covers, which uh, are going for a pretty. Now, look, this book is everywhere. Everybody saw this book coming. I just said there's 150,000. And I'm telling you, a large chunk of that is that Chadwick Boseman cover. I still love that cover as a long-term play. Look at what the Spawn books have done over time. Even when a Spawn book gets overprinted, think like the Obama wins or the Romney wins Watchmen covers. And even when every other Spawn book in that run took off and that one still just couldn't quite get going, look at where it is now. You just got to give Spawn time. Everything with Spawn is a great long-term play. That's kind of secret sauce. But um, this cover, I think, is going to have legs for just, it's really, it's cultural significance. Yeah, and there's a lot of Spawn going on right now, not just in comics. I mean, McFarlane had that Kickstarter for that action figure. Yep. They have Kickstarters for Spawn reprints. But Spawn's definitely hot right now, which is what we talked about on 3 Up, 3 Down a couple weeks ago as well. But that's going to wrap up the first appearance section for this week. So now we're going to roll over into those Reader Buzz books. Kicking off the Reader Buzz section, this is that Jeff Johns greatness. And we're talking about Three Jokers number three. There was Reader Buzz. The book came out. I heard some people not care too much for this issue as well. All right. So I can only give my take. And I, and I really do want to hear everyone's take in the comment section. Um, I am a huge Jeff Johns fan. I know people kind of get divided on that. And I think with DC Comics, I, first off, I'm, I'm comics positive. Like I, I tend to, I like the things that a lot of other people like. Uh, uh, Rob Liefeld's antics are still heartwarming to me. They don't turn me off the way everybody else gets. Um, you know, I enjoyed Tom King's Batman run. It wasn't my favorite Batman run, but I enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, here, I've always loved Jeff Johns, uh, whether it was his Aquaman New 52 run, which I think is the best Aquaman ever, his, his Green Lantern 1 through 20 or 0 through 20, which now we're going to see play out in HBO Max is amazing. Uh, his Green Lantern run before that was incredible. I know, Brian, that's one of your favorites. Uh, but, you know, Doomsday Clock. Justice League as well. Yes, yes. Doomsday Clock I was so extremely excited for, and I like it but it didn't necessarily give me the feeling I was anticipating. That's exactly how I feel about three jokers. So I enjoyed it. I don't want to say I didn't like it um, specifically issue three, but I went into issue three with kind of this hope that like all these questions that I ever had were going to be answered. Um, and you certainly don't walk away with that. That's not, that's not how you're walking away from this issue. Um, and <laughs> You're like Ralphie and your oval tea pen. Yeah. <laughs> <Coming> commercial. <laughs> yeah. Like 
And then, like, I went through, like, these, like, stages of grief almost after reading this book where it was, like, at first I was, like, really bummed and frustrated. And then I was, like, well, maybe I'm being too hard on it. Like, the, the book was still good. The art was awesome. Like, but then I was, like, well, maybe there'll be a sequel. Maybe there'll be three Jokers, too, and then they'll, they'll continue. And I was, like, no, but th- that's the point. Why, why, did I, why did I have to read this just to get to more? Um, so, you know, it, it's a, it was a nice Elseworld story. Uh, but it, it, it didn't really feel like it answered these undying questions of the DC universe for me. Yeah. Some of them artistic art interpretations, right? Where no, you, the reader are supposed to decide kind of like when how Sopranos ended. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. And I just, I never, I never get down for that type, that type (laughs) of ending. Like I want you to tell me, spell it out for me. What am I looking at? Yeah. But the next one on Reader Buzz, we got that Batman Beyond number 48. Yeah, and it's funny because Batman Beyond was red hot around the time we talked already about Batwoman Beyond. And you and I predicted it. We said, you know, this happens because we're Batman Beyond fans. It's funny. Like, we caught a lot of shit because a lot of people kind of thought we were like anti-Batman Beyond. And it's like, nah, like that's not the case. Both of us love that character. We're just we don't sit the Kool-Aid where everyone thinks it's going to be like the biggest thing. And it's like, yeah, it's going to take time. It's a reader buzz story. You got to develop it. Um, and people jumped off of Batman. Beyond. They introduce but a lot of great characters in that series too. They really do. And they really do. And I think what's great about Batman beyond is because it was just why I think you and I are so positive about future state while we were positive about five G's. When you get into a new timeline, it allows you to introduce so much newness um, and it, that doesn't come off cash grabby because the world feels emptier than this very crowded universe that we operate in both Marvel and DC currently. So um, this book, though, is, is getting reader buzz attention because it brings Batman Beyond into current time. So Booster Gold brings Batman Beyond into uh, the current uh, DC universe. So I did not get a chance to read this one yet, but it's on my list of books to read. And I'm inter- I read all- I read Batman Beyond regardless, but it's one that I wanted to kind of like get on top of um, because I'm, I'm interested to see if this is going to lead to any future storylines. Uh, I would love to see Batman Beyond, you know, especially like think about like Into the Spider-Verse and what like the doors that that's open. I would love to see Batman Beyond in the next major uh, Batman event. Like the next time there's a Joker war, I would love to see Batman Beyond have to get involved in that. And sticking with DC again, we're going over to Red Hood with Red Hood Outlaws number 50. This is a series we haven't talked about in a while as well. Yeah, and here, um, this is another one that I really need to read. There was some serious reader buzz going into this one. Some talk about it being the final issue. Um, and a lot of changes going into the, to this character. And a lot, of, a lot of story development has been going into Red Hood recently. Um, and there re- I can you really see uh, what's going on? I got to tell you, man, be on the lookout for first appearance. Now, we've already highlighted Jason Todd's individual first appearance, as well as even what we think is even more valuable is first appearance as the Red Hood um, on our top 10 back issue list, as well as on SimpleMensComics.com, the digital book for 100 great um, back issues to buy. Uh, but we think that Jason Todd is, is, is a long-term play. Having said that, it, it's very clear DC's making moves with this character right now. From the, uh, the death in the family uh, uh, story that we're seeing play out, that they just did the animated that tied in with the Red Hood. Um, from the fact that we're getting Red Hood and Titans this season, and they just put out those uh, images, and the internet went nuts for that, and everybody's all excited. Um, the Red Hood has been a focus of video games, uh, uh, will continue to be a focus of video games, upcoming video games. And all of that shows me that this is a character that DC sees money in. So this is a character I'm very bullish on, whether we're talking current publishing or we're talking back issues. It's one I think to pay attention to because they can expand the world a lot within current publishing. And I think that those back issues, even though, yeah, they sit at nice prices, are still undervalued for the potential because this is a character that has the cool factor, is in the Batman universe, um, and kind of gives a completely, completely different take from Batman. It, and let's be honest, it's that Stone Cold Steve Austin anti-hero. It, it's where it's like, 
he's not a good guy. He's not a bad guy. Uh, he's just a badass. And, you know, that gives you that kind of, like I said, that Stone Cold Steve Austin 90s nostalgia attitude era feel. Yeah, my favorite Red Hood actor, which was just a voice actor, still old good mm -hmm. Jensen Ackles, the old Winchester brother. Bring him back. <laughs> Bring him back. But moving on into that reader buzz, the next one we're talking about is one of the favorite series on this channel. We're talking about Canto 2 Holloman, issue number three. Yeah, it, it's funny. Look at the sales of the one in 10 variant. This one clearly got slept on by retailers. Now, it's, I got to say, I, you and I love this book. This is like home to us. But at the same point, I got to give some retailers some, some credit and say, hey, this would, is a tough week when you're looking at your order form. Um, you know you're putting in major three Jokers orders. Ronan, uh, we haven't even gotten there yet, obviously is the book. Um, that everybody is gonna is gonna be paying attention to, uh, and and there's just several key books still to talk about, and um, this is a tough week of ordering. So I think there was an, a shortage on this book. I think there was an under ordering of this book in comparison to some of the other ones. So this is one to pay attention to and be on the lookout for. But delivers again. Um, at this point, I, I, if you like this book, I, I, I have complete faith in this team that they're going to keep delivering quality and quality and quality um, as long as they decide to write Canto, which sounds like from our last conversation on this channel could be quite some time. Yep. Seven seasons in a movie. Yes. Yes. But here we also, this week, we have that second issue of the other James Tynan series. And we're talking about department of truth, right? Number two. Yes. And you know, what's great about this is, is it's, it's maintained reader buzz. It's also maintained secondary market interest with that one in 25 variant, which is disturbing. <laughs> and so between, uh, between that, the, the fact that they, you've got the reader buzz, you've got the variant buzz, um, it'll be interesting to see what the sales figures come in at because uh, issue one did 100,000, which is an enormous number for a creator-owned book, especially you know one coming from Image Comics. So it'll be great to see what is number two dr drop in at. Um, I think that 125 is going to keep that number solid. Usually we see a 50% drop off. So, so this book is on schedule. We should see about a 50,000 print run on issue two. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it comes in more or less. But this book has maintained reader buzz, but it's one that I want to know. I haven't gotten a chance to read issue two yet. Um, I read the PDF a, a while back, um, but need to get updated again. So let us know about how, how you guys are feeling about this one. Um, and I, I will always want to hear too, because we've been talking about this. I've been talking about this too on some other channels. How long do you guys give an independent comic series? Because Brian, you and I are got to give it the first art kind of guys. Um, but there's a lot of people that want to jump off after one issue. I think you got to give the story time. Yeah, and speaking of independent comics, here's one. We didn't talk about this published for a while, but we've been talking about them like back to back to back. Ooh. This is like third week in a row. We're going over to Vault Comics with Giga number one. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of buzz on this. And we've talked about this about other books. And we talked about this on the last call show when we talked about this specific book. The thing that we found interesting is that a lot of other industry professionals who have nothing to do with Vault, don't work at Vault, don't have books at Vault, um, were talking about this book. This book had yeah, the All attention. over Twitter today. Yeah, it had the attention of a lot of other creators, a lot of other industry professionals. Anybody who has, is any sort of a Gundam fan, anybody who's an anime fan is very excited about this. Um, the creative team seems to have a lot of support in the industry. Especially that with tends, that variant. Right, well, yeah. Then we get into that. And so that, that tends to bode well. But I was going to say that. I think while all of that is good, I think what's really been the, the extra driving force, the secret sauce, is that Shogun Warriors uh, homage and kind of the tie-in to those type of properties and the fact that I think you're really pulling a lot of that like Transformers, Macross, uh, ROM type of crowd into this release of a creator-owned title which is unique and cool. So this is a big, big success. And it's showing the, the, the heat behind Vault because this is a completely different title from the last couple successful titles from Vault. And they, they can kind of show that they can play in different lanes. Not only that, I just saw a couple more number ones announced by Vault today. Um, I don't know if it was announced today, but I saw them today. And it's like, man, talk about a company that knows how to strike when the iron's hot they see they see the I success they took, i won't say they took a little time off but that's what just what it kind of feels like right? oh, did, we're yeah. gonna rest a little bit and then we're just gonna regroup and come back 
It did. It felt like the Wassel brothers were on the ranch, but uh, <laughs> while it may have felt to us like, you know, they were just out there, uh, you know, working out and, and being uh, the ranch hands that they are, uh, in reality, it sounds like a lot of goodness was being cooked up behind the scenes. And now we're getting the, the, the fruits of that labor. Next one, we're going over to Marvel. And this is one of those staples. Anytime it comes out, it's hitting the reader buzz section. It's also, anytime it's hitting FOC, it's hitting that lost call. And we're talking about Strange Academy number four. But we always talk like it feels like it's about 20 issues in, right? Right, yeah. And then that's the later prints have certainly done that, right? Because we're just constantly, it feels like we're always talking about a, a Strange Academy book, like every week. Uh, and, and shout out to the Comic Corps who did uh, uh -huh. the Baltimore Comic Con uh, this weekend. They had Scotty Young uh, on doing a panel talking about um, uh, Strange Academy and kind of like the, the inspiration and his excitement over the book. And I watched a little bit of that interview and I got to say it does, it, it does bode well for this title that there's number one, it seems like they can kind of play with an open playing field and number two. So it's almost a creator owned title within the Marvel universe. And then number two, the fact that Scott Young, who's a major, major creator, it seems so very invested in this and these characters that creator. And also, you know, what makes me feel good, Brian, when we, when we talked about our trepidation over this title, when we first started talking it, we both said that the one thing that was concerning is, well, Gotham Academy never did anything. Now, a couple of the Gotham Academy characters are being used in the current DC publishing, and Gotham Academy back issues are taking off. Yeah. So I think that bodes well for Strange Academy, but I got to wonder if DC hasn't seen this Strange Academy success and said, hey, we have our own academy. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. Blow, blow the yeah. dust off of that. Yeah, yeah. But sticking with Marvel, also with that reader buzz, we get the Exosword Stasis number one. This is another book we talked about on the last call show as well. Super split reactions to this one. This is one of those polarizing releases where half the people are like, I love this book. And half the old school X-Men fans I've talked to are like, some of this doesn't make sense. This isn't the X-Men I like. Um, I've said from the beginning, I have no problem with the fact that everybody loves this X-Men in the Hickman era, and I don't. Um, it's not, I think X-Men, um, I like the simplicity of it mixed with the kind of like political undertones that make X-Men what it is. Um, I think that th this Hickman stuff makes me feel stupid. I've, I've openly said that, like, I don't feel smart enough uh, to read a Hickman book. It takes me like three times to go through. Um, and I think a lot of the community sits there and it's like, yeah, man, it's awesome. But it's like, it's, it's kind of like everybody says the same thing. But th I, at the same point, I don't want to minimize anybody's viewpoint. So if you like it, you like it. And, that's, and, I, and, I've, and I've tapped out on this, on, on this topic because I know that the community has dug this. But I've heard from a lot of people that they kind of felt the same way reading this book. Um, I know like uh, Larry Doherty, uh, a very popular retailer, was very vocal on Twitter today. But he, had, he acknowledged, he said, it's funny because he went on this like rant about how he didn't really feel like this book was, you know, indicative of the X-Men that he know, knew. But then he said, having said that, it's selling like hotcakes. So people clearly like it. And, I, and it's one of those things. So it's, I can say all of this, but it really doesn't matter. If, you, if everybody likes it, if you guys out there like it, then they're going to keep making it. Um, and I'm just happy that the X-Men is getting the attention that it's getting. Um, and the one weird thing that I want to say that I like about this is, you know, we always talk about crossovers and the different titles and how that can be confusing. They've done a really good job with this one, with this crossover, letting you know like what part of the story it is through the marketing, through the trade dress. I think they could do that better on some of their other crossovers. Um, I think it would help with like King and Black or things like that if you, and add gravitas to books that maybe would just be seen as, oh, that's just a little time. I've said it before, I'll say it again. There's just too many X books for me to keep up with it's like that's what the x is you got to solve for x and the x equals five thousand <laughs> crossover and tie-ins tie or additional books either way i've, I've always said i have i wasn't a, i haven't been a huge x-men fan either way but the last one we're talking about on the reader buzz is draken new dawn number three this could have been maybe on the first appearance too because don't we get a first appearance of a new team 
Yeah, the Shattered um, show up in this uh, Draken New Dawn number three. Uh, you know, it'll be it'd be interesting to see if there's any long term play or if this stays within this kind of um, Draken universe here. Uh, but this this new team is featured on our Simpleman's Comics, the six one six Comics exclusive variant for Draken New Dawn number three by Steve Morris, which is available at the six one six Comics dot com, uh, limited to five hundred copies. Uh, so we were able to, to get that on the cover uh, and that completes our three cover set. So we were pretty happy about that. That's, that, that's certainly very cool. Uh, and this has been a great series. If you're, if you're into Power Rangers comics, this has been awesome. A lot of fun. It definitely unexpected. We, uh, each issue really, uh, the first off the, the main character wasn't the dragon we were expecting. You know, this wasn't the droid you were looking for, but it, 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 was surprisingly excellent really built off of the ranger slayer one shot um and i think that that boom did a great job over the last several months building buzz for power rangers leading into their new power Rangers series launching soon yeah also if you want to know more about this title friends of the channel burke family 54 comics his youtube channel he did a spoiler free review up there if you guys want to check that out as well yes and he is far more knowledgeable about Power Rangers than Brian and I combined. Yeah. He's like that consultant they're going to hire on set. Yeah. <laughs> but either way, that wraps up the reader buzz section. So now we're getting into that big shiny object and we're talking about the variant buzz. First book on the variant buzz section, we're going to talk about the Action Comics 1016, that Lucio Perillo variant, right? Yeah, so we're going to talk about some DC cover Bs because they got a lot of attention this week, some great cover art now. Whether or not we see any long-term gains with them, this has been a topic of this channel. If you're a new follower, Brian and I are bullish long-term on these DC cover Bs. Low buy-ins, these cover art rival exclusive variants. You look at the price that people are paying for exclusive variants, and then you look at the, the DC cover Bs. It's why in our variant production that Brian and I have been kind of like, scared to get not scared but cautious to get in the dc game because it's hard to top what they offer for three and four dollars and we're going to talk about a specific artist where that comes into play in a couple of picks but this is an amazing cover lucio perillo it depicts all of the super family so you got supergirl you've got superboy prime you've got uh, uh jonathan ken all in costume really cool cover i think is one that has some potential long-term to be, if that ever is depicted in, in a television show, think Lois and Clark, that's starting now in the CW in the future. Um, if that kind of a scene, this could be a book that people go back to. Yeah, the next one, this is probably one of my favorites, and that's oh. that Wonder Woman 765, that Josh Middleton. He's been banging out some covers for Wonder Woman lately, just like he was doing for Bagger earlier. Right, and if you're if you're looking at this cover on the screen, I don't need to sell you on this cover. This cover is amazing, and it, it's really, really um, almost gives you that Gal Gadot feel. Uh, and I, I think that Middleton has revitalized his brand by switching, and I think that that's something that DC maybe should pull the trigger on a little faster. I'd like to see guys do like. Um, you know, six covers on a title and yeah. then switch to another. They move them over to Catwoman. Yeah, because I mean, it, it, they Frizen got a little stale on on um, Wonder Woman. Middleton got a little stale on Bat on Batgirl, where they they put out great covers yeah. and they weren't getting the credit for them because the market was just. It was funny though when Batgirl started picking up, people started going back and picking up those Aquaman covers of Middleton as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's why we are bullish long term on uh, people going back and picking up covers for some of the cover art subjects, some of the cover artists. Um, I think DC's done a great job of putting out high, high quality covers for very cheap. And uh, I, I tell you, one I'd be on the lookout for is some of those, uh, some of those Jessica Cruz DC cover B covers. Yeah. Then sticking with those cover Bs, the next one we're talking about is that Cal New. That Justice League Dark 27, right? So this is one that I really want to talk about. So people got hype about this cover and we have seen it posted all over the place. This is a prime example. First off, this is why I love exclusive variants because this is an artist that was made through the through the process of exclusive variants. And this, DC has done a great job of paying attention to the exclusive variant market. 
see who retailers want to work with, see who collectors are buying, and then to grab up those artists. Uh, this is a great cover. I love this cover. I'm not, I, I have nothing bad to say about this cover, so don't take it that way. The point I'm, I'm saying is, um, to me, when I looked at this cover, I was like, well, this is, this, is, this, this is what he has delivered on every, whether it's Frankie's Comics or any other um, store that he has worked with, he has delivered this level of quality. But again, now you're getting it for cover price. And you look at um, specifically this Justice League Dark title, somebody who's editing this title is paying attention to Frankie's comments because they went with Clayton Crane and now, and now we get new in here. So like, I just really think that um, uh, they are paying attention to that market. And these are just amazing, amazing covers. So if you're a fan of the artist and you know, maybe you don't want to pay those $15 uh, exclusive variant prices that a lot of stores are selling exclusive for. It's an awesome opportunity to be able to pick up a cover price book. And um, we've seen this now with like Alan Qua. We've seen this with... Um, yeah, Alan uh, Qua with Nightwing. Yeah, with Night, exactly, with Nightwing. Um, we've started to see some of these like people who are really synonymous with exclusive variants start to show up and do DC cover Bs. And, we just talked about a Perillo book, and certainly Perillo is a prime, prime example. Uh, before his foray into exclusive variants, the only thing he had really done is some dynamite comic stuff with like Red Sonia and Warlord, Son of Mars, and things like that. Yeah, and I mean, Justice League Dark, I haven't been paying attention to like the pr the sales figures on it, but I couldn't imagine it selling more uh, than yeah. what, 20, 25,000, maybe more. I don't know. Could be way off base there, but just no, the no, yeah, it's not, it's not. I mean, ha we haven't had reader buzz on it for quite some time. Um, the, the only time we've talked about it is when they've had like a hot Bermejo cover or they had a hot Clayton Crean cover. Um, and, and so this got some late attention. This was a really late addition to this list, but I'm glad we got a chance to talk about this because it's a trend that we're paying attention to. And I think the last time we talked about it was what the, when it first kicked off with Rebirth, what was it, the Upside Down Man or whatever it was? Yep. Yeah, so that's why that's why I'm like, hey, this is this is why these are lottery tickets because you're getting this great cover art for so cheap. Yeah. Next one, we're talking about the variants of this book. This is probably one of the books that people are looking out for most this week because it got delayed. It's supposed to come out months earlier, but we got those last Ronin exclusives and store exclusives, right? Yeah. So that the last Ronin incentives and store exclusives, it really doesn't matter. Now, sixty five. Uh, store exclusives. Um, there are, uh, you know, the one in 25, a one in a one in 10, and there's going to be a variant sent to retailers, a foil variant on December 2nd, the day that the second print comes out as like an, it's a one in 75 variant. And that's going to be like an, a, they're calling like the apology variant because of the uh, under production of the book. Um, and there's some great conspiracy theories out there about that under production. But, um, you know, these variants, whether we're talking, this book is red hot and we're, I don't want to step on us talking about the book, but the book being as hot as it is, has caused literally every cover, whether we're talking exclusive or we're talking incentive to get hot. The incentives are well over ratio. Um, the exclusives are all in demand. And if they haven't sold it out, they're selling out. Um, nobody, I repeat, nobody has lost money on a last Ronin uh, variant. That's how how this book has been. Yeah, unless they just don't get all they ordered. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? So we talked about the Reader Buzz books. We've talked about the first appearances. We've talked about the variant buzz. That just leaves us now with Jack's long term play. <laughs> And the long-term play is something that we kind of just talked about with those incentives and exclusives, but your long-term play this week is the last Ronin number one. That's right. And usually I avoid these completely obvious plays, right? Um, but you and I have been excited about this from the moment it was announced. Um, I, I'll admit I can be a sucker for an emotional move, moment uh, uh, in movie and TV, but I was really surprised at how affected I was watching the toys that made us in the reuniting of Eastman and Laird. Um, it, it seemed to mean so much to them. I was surprised how much it meant to me. And then when they announced this comic, uh, especially since if you watch that episode, they talk about in that, in that episode about how cool it would be to come together and do another story. Um, 
when that announcement got made, I was already sold. And I think most turtle fans were, this has gotten regular turtle fans on board. This has gotten lapsed turtle fans on board. This has gotten casual turtle fans on board. And then this has brought in those collectors, retailers, uh, flippers, speculators, investors, everyone in between is in on this book. Um, it delivered from a reading perspective it was shocking at times the attempted suicide. Uh, you, I know you read this, Brian was surprising to me, but it quickly reminded you, you are not reading the TMNT ongoing. You are reading some old school Eastman and Laird here. Um, and that, you know, the samurai kind of the whole honor of it. Uh, it, it, it was like a guy hard with turtles. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was a, it was a shocking um, uh, moment. And, and I really think that it set this whole first issue, while maybe it didn't give us all the answers we want, um, is going to set the tone. Now I say that because, and we're going to talk spoilers here. Um, I want to make that. So if you're not, if you haven't read this book and you want to get away from here, you may want to click off here, but um, the, there's going to be some questions coming out of this issue. There already is the comma. The comma is going to be the debated thing. Um, and we've already seen so many um, social media influencers come out and really like stake their, their, their opinion on this. I'll be honest with you, Brian, I'm scared too. I'm scared. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, the comma argument makes sense. So at the end, when we see the turtle in the hospital post suicide attempt, and there's old woman April O'Neil there, uh, and she said, "Is talking to him," and she says, "Who are you talking to?" Comma Michelangelo question mark. Immediately, the market took it as she's saying, "Who are you talking to, Michelangelo?" But if you add that comment comma in there, who are, it comes off kind of like, "Who are you talking to, Michelangelo?" So is she asking the turtle if he's talking to Michelangelo or is she calling him Michelangelo? And that question I think is very intentionally ambiguous. Um, so that's part of what's going to make this story intriguing. It's certainly affecting back issues. We've seen the, uh, like the Michelangelo macro series is selling the Michelangelo Christmas special is selling. Uh, and we know that these were already books that people were paying attention to for last running spec, especially that Christmas special. Um, and it, it's one of those things where it, this story could take twists and turns. You know, we, you know, we don't know where it's going to go, but I think issue number two is going to be buzz. I think there's going to be buzz on issue number three. This is very unique. I can't wait to see what the sales numbers are because we've heard, well, what's been reported by Diamond is that IDW undershipped this book by 130,000 copies. Now, if I told you that this book sold 130,000 copies, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles book, that would be news, monumental news. The fact that it undershipped by 130,000, how many did it sell? Did it sell 170? Did it sell 250? Um, what is the number? And then, there, like I mentioned, conspiracy theories. There's conspiracy theories out there. IEW made this book returnable. Did they intentionally undership because they were afraid of returns? Seems illogical to me that they'd be afraid of returns. Like I said, this is just one of the – I look at it and go, they missed – they lost money. They're Especially coming. when it was delayed and then orders just doubled off to that. Yeah, so when it, it – it, that's a great point, too, the delay. When it was delayed, we didn't have an exclusive variant for this book. We had, we had started working on exclusive variants – after the deadline to get in for this book. And it was one of those things where we were like, oh man, it would have been awesome to do last Ronin. And then when the delay happened, I immediately asked my partners, like, what do you guys think? Like last Ronin, should we try to get in? And we were surprised that we got in, but not only did we get in, like 20 other dealers got in. And, and some of the dealers who sold out of their original books went and created second and third variants because why not? Like the demand for this book was there. Um, and, and like I said, everybody has sold these books well because just people, people are just so into this story. So uh, it, this is just a great story in comics. I'm starting to get disappointed by how often IDW messes up these big moments, whether or not it's Canto and the printing errors um, or the shortage here, which Diamond has been very clear to say is IDW. It's not us. We wanted to fulfill every order that we got. Um, and it's very frustrating because we, we sit here and preach every week, right? FOC, 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 FOC. 
And it's frustrating that a comic book shop can put their FOC order in and get shorted incentives, get shorted uh, cover, main covers. Um, the amount of stores that pre-sold hundreds of copies of this book and are now going to have to do re refunds is terrible. And th we should only be talking positive about this. This is a book that brought people into comic shops. And it's very rare that we get those anchor books that make, like, it's, you, you know them when you see them, that they just bring people into the shops. The guy who hasn't bought a comic book in six months, but it's like, man, I got to get off my ass and go in and get that book. That's a moment where a comic shop gets to, it gets to capitalize. And in order to do that, they need the stock. They need the inventory. I also will say I don't totally buy into the whole, like, they shorted it on purpose because they were afraid of returnability because all of their number ones, all of their number ones are returnable. That's a pretty standard thing. So maybe they did that in it because they were afraid, but if, if they did it because they were afraid, um, I sit there and I would go, well, then you guys don't want to sell comics because if the whole point of making them returnable is to incentivize people to order them, people did it. And now you don't want to sell them. That would be silly. So uh, either way, this is one of those good and bad, but I think it really reminds me of Canto where as long as there's like controversy surrounding a release and there's, um, there's things that we're going to talk about and uh, you know, shortages on the market, then we're going to end up having secondary market spikes. It all becomes part of the story. Uh, you know, we've talked about that with the creators of Canto about how their story is certainly as much about the printing errors and um some of the fiasco that they've had with the printing situations as anything else. I think Last Ronin is going to be about delays and shortages and uh, all of those things mixed in along with amazing storytelling and back issue gold. But long term, because of how interested everybody is, I don't see that dying out. And because this story so far has delivered on it in a way that I'll say like three jokers didn't, I really think long-term this issue specifically number one is going to be a book that will be a key issue, a wall book in the next 20, 30 years. Uh, almost. I, I just, I just can't imagine it. Not. I can see it being like the killing joke type book. Yes, exactly. That's a great, that is a great analogy. But also, yeah, you mentioned conspiracy. I don't think there's conspiracy theories. I think one IDW has problems within their freaking leadership right now, Absolutely. but their, their new president that's been there like two months, is gone. <laughs> I mean, right. they keep replacing leadership and executives. I, I don't know. I'm not on the inside, but yeah, crazy stuff. I read the first issue. I think I liked it more just because of everything you said at the beginning of the segment with the toys that made us the creative team reading the actual story. If it was like anyone else say you can substitute a turtle for something else. I probably wouldn't have been a type on the system on, on the story on that issue. I mean, some guy trying to <laughs> trying to get at the top of a building with a bunch of robots chasing him. That story in itself, it's, it doesn't describe a great book, but knowing the creative yeah. team, knowing the history, knowing the lore, knowing what it's building up to. And then of course, at the end of it, but the comma, no comma, either way, it, all that history and lore is what makes that issue great in my opinion just being a turtle fan, the nostalgia driven up to it and him talking to the turtles throughout the story as well. But either way, uh, great long-term pick, great long-term pick. The only thing else I don't like is just the size of the issue. Yeah. I am glad though. They changed it to magazine size. That it, to me is a big save. Uh, if this would have been oversized larger than magazine as it was supposed to be and wouldn't fit in bags and boards and wouldn't fit in, in, in Gemini mailers, that would have been a disaster for retailers everywhere. So I'm glad they put it at least to magazine size. And the one positive I'll say about that is um, because it's magazine size, it'll still be gradable. And these came in in really nice condition because of the square bound nature. I think there's going to be some high grades, um, but I know you, you're a purist, man. You like your floppies, you know, yeah. all uniform. I, I have magazine short boxes already. So it doesn't, it, cause I, I like to dig in the magazines. I'm a foom guy. I'm a, you know, I'm into that kind of stuff. So I, I it doesn't, it, it does this magazine doesn't bother me. Uh, it, when they were coming out with some oversized, enormous print size comic, then I was kind of like, what are you doing? Yeah. But 
You, the viewer, let us know what books you guys picked up this week. Let us know what stories you read. Let us know, especially if they're not even on this list. But there's our Bolo list for this week. This is Jack of Browse of Men's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.